All right. So uh, there is uh, the first problem of the current assignment is posted on the engineering the final problem. I'll be posted later today. So, um, and we are having an exam coming up. Uh, and it will cover through the material on the simple harmonic oscillator, which we will finish today. And then you have this second assignment done uh, as well. Um, and I've gotten some feedback, but I'll wait to hear more. As I uh, asked last lecture, um, what your preference is for a take-home exam or an exam of the sort we had for the first exam. Uh, a take-home exam has the advantage of much less time pressure, but it'll be a little bit of a more you know, challenging exam. So there are trade-offs uh, there. So uh, get me your feedback on that. Just send me some email. Okay. All right. Um, very good. So, um, last time we talked about uh, uncertainty relations related to the simple harmonic oscillator. Um, so if we look at the uh, position and momentum of the uh, particle in the simple harmonic well, then in the number basis, that is the energy eigenstates, the mean position and the mean momentum is zero. Okay? And they, of course, have the uh, fluctuations in those values. That is to say, uh, if we were to measure the position of momentum, we wouldn't necessarily get a definite value. We'd get some random value about that mean with fluctuations given by the variances or the we want the RMS is the fluctuation, and that we calculated uh, just looking at base using the operator algebra and the position momentum uh, variances in the nth energy level is equal to n plus a half. Something we could have just seen just looking at what we know, of course, the energy eigenvalue is n plus a half h bar omega. And there's equal amounts in this, so we could just read it off just from the energy eigenvalues. Um, right. And so in the ground state, the in these dimensionless units, the uh, uncertainty is in the RMS is one over root two. So we have 1 over root 2 in dimensionless units of delta x and delta p in the dimensionless units. If we put the units back in, then these are the uncertainties. Okay? And as we saw, as we know, that those are, that's a minimum uncertainty uh, state. That's to say delta x times delta p is the minimum value allowed by the uncertainty. And that we could have, we saw that also from the fact that in position and momentum space, the wave function was a Gaussian. A Gaussian uh, with delta x being the minimum delta x. If we, if we had the Fourier transform limited Gaussian pulse, it's a minimum uncertainty wave function. Um, I'm going to come back to this in a moment. I want to. I really meant to say this first, so let's talk about this. There's another kind of uncertainty relation, one that is only, not always talked about, but should be. And that's number phase uncertainty. Okay. So if I just, this is a terrible picture. Let me try. Well, I'm going to try. You get the picture. These are circles. Uh, sorry. Um, Classically, we can think about different sets of canonical coordinates. Okay? We have x and p. 
That's a, a set of conjugate variables, right? We also have what are called action angle variables. If you ever take an advanced course on dynamics, you learn about those things. They're really just, in the case of the harmonic oscillator, they are the polar coordinates of phase space. So I have an amplitude and a phase. That's a, those are conjugate variables in classical mechanics, just like X and P. Right? Um, and in the context of the harmonic oscillator, uh, we know that, you know, we call these things the quadratures of the oscillator, right? And, uh, and this is the amplitude and the phase of the oscillator. Um, now, of course, when we go to the quantum description, then what we said is that, you know, this classical amplitude became the annihilation operator, the lower operator. Which has, is a non-hermitian operator. It has a hermitian part and an anti-emission part. Now, we could try, and it's a natural thing to do, to think about not a decomposition of this operator in terms of its sort of real and imaginary parts, its emission and anti-emission parts, but in terms of a polar decomposition, which we studied at the beginning of the semester. It's just an exercise in operator algebra. And so we could think about this. It would be natural to think that this could be written as, uh, you know, some kind of amplitude and phase. And the amplitude, loosely, is the square root, you know, A, of course, here is the square root of alpha star alpha. And so you might think, well, this is the square root of A dagger A times some e to the i phi operator. It's a natural thing to do. Actually, it's not quite, I mean, if you were to do the polar decomposition, of course, there's a right and a left unitary, as we studied in that homework assignment. So we could write in the polar decomposition. We would say that this is equal to some unitary times the square root. If this is, I'll write it on the left. If we're going to write it as a dagger a, then I write it right on the left. And this would be unitary. And a unitary, we know, is of the form e to the i times our permission operator, which we would call the phase operator. The problem is that this doesn't work. And in infinite dimensions, things are just different about linear operators. There is no polar decomposition of A in this way. There is no permission operator that does this, that allows us to make this composition. So this isn't true. Okay? So there does not exist a phase operator. We cannot write a canonical set of coordinates quantum mechanically that are the equivalent exactly of amplitude and phase. However, well, that doesn't mean that in some sense amplitude and phase are not conjugate variables quantum mechanically in the same way that position moments are. There is a generalization. So what we showed last time was the following measure, that I can decompose a, this is true, that there is an operator, I'll call e to the i with a big hat over the whole thing, without putting the hat over the phi, because this is not the exponentiation of a Hermitian operator, times the square root of the number operator. And a dagger is this, where I wrote e to the i 
identify as an operator uh, that does the lowering. Okay. The problem is that this is not unitary. It looks unitary. It looks unitary because a unitary operator takes an orthogonal basis to an orthogonal basis. But the fact that this starts at n equals 1 and not equals, n doesn't go to n equals minus infinity is why this is not unitary. And you can see that. You can just try, if you look at the, the uh, commutator of this with this, what it equals is this. And since this doesn't commute with its adjoint, it's not a normal operator. Normal operators commute with their adjoints. This doesn't. So it's not unitary. It has no, uh, it's not a unitary operator. And the reason it's not is because this is, if you look back at this picture, it's this, what goes on here. We can't displace beyond this point. We get to the minimum point and we're stuck. There's a kind of singularity that would be hard. However, in, there is an approximate sense in which uh, these guys are conjugate. What we can say is that approximately, just like x and p. The, there's a very sophisticated mathematics in which we can kind of derive this based on the theory of POVX, which I'm not going to describe in great detail, but just give you a little flavor for it. And that's the following. We can define phase states, states of definite phase. These states were defined to be the states which are the equal superposition of all the number states. So in some sense, this is conjugate. In the same way that when we had a, a position eigenstate, a position eigenstate is a superposition of all the momentum states with equal weighting and a momentum eigenstate is a superposition of all the position eigenstates with equal weighting. X and P are conjugate. Number and phase are conjugate. Okay. The problem with these states is that they're not orthogonal. Let's just look at that. If I look at this for two different guys, uh, or plus there, did I get that wrong? This is a prime. 
So that's not a delta function. It would be a delta function if this was from minus infinity to infinity, but it's not a delta. So these are not orthogonal states. They're not the eigenstates of a Hermitian operator. However, what is true is that these states, you can check this, form a resolution of the identity. Which means that they form an overcomplete basis in the same way that X and P do. Now, since there is, this is a resolution of the identity, this is a POTN. That is to say, I can look at this as an integral over all this guy of positive operators. They're not orthogonal projectors. It's not a projective measurement because these guys are not orthogonal for different phi's. But that's okay. We learned that not every measurement is an orthogonal projective measurement. We could do measurements that are associated with non-orthogonal positive operators, which would say, now I ask you, what would be the probability of finding, or probability density, of finding phi? So this is this. That's what we learned sometime at the beginning of the semester and have daily forgotten. That's the Born rule with POVMs rather than projectors. Right? And of course, if this was a mixed state, we would say it was this. Because that's how you find expectation values if you have mixed states. Okay. This is the probability. And so there, in principle, exists a measurement. It's not a measurement on a Hermitian observable. But we learned that not every measurement in quantum mechanics is a measurement on a Hermitian observable. So it's perfectly fine to talk about phase in quantum mechanics in the same way, even though there is no phase operator. There is a measure we can try to rig up. Now, it's not easy, and we don't know how to do it necessarily easily in the lab, but it's a perfectly good thing to think about. And that would be equal to, in this case, if it's a pure state, that's equal to um, this probability distribution is 1 over 2 pi, or sorry, yeah, 1 over 2 pi the phase states, which is 1 over 2 pi, the sum over n equals 0 to infinity, is the i n phi minus n And it follows from this, the fact that this probability distribution is like this, that we get from this we can derive this. For states far mean and not near the origin where things go haywire. And what that tells us is that number and phase are conjugate. That is to say, this is approximately true. I wrote a quarter here last time, but I meant a half. Thanks for pointing that out.
Right. Okay. So um, let's go back now to dynamics. So another thing we talked about last time was the dynamical evolution of the system for the simple harmonic oscillator. The fundamental object is the time evolution operator. And that has this simple form. Okay. We typically ignore this overall phase. It affects nothing. So we typically just write it like that. Okay. And what we showed last time, and it's very easy to show, is that the Heisenberg equations of motion for the quantum operators are exactly the classical differential equations. This is exactly the same thing. Okay, and the solution is exactly the same as we had in classical dynamics. So one thing we see here, and again, this goes to this number phase uncertainty relation, is that n, the number operator, is the generator of translations in phase. is this thing would just go around, translate, and phase. So that's why n is conjugate to phase. Okay? And phase is, generates translations in n. It's conjugate to n. All right. So this seems to indicate that everything about the simple harmonic oscillator is in some sense classical because the equations of motion are the same. Well, that's a little, there's subtleties involved there. For example, if I was in a stationary state with some energy eigenvalue n, then the mean position momentum are for all time zero. And that's not classical. So the stationary states aren't really representing the classical evolution. Even though we talked about the WKB approximation and the fact that at high n, we see something about the wave function building up near the turning points in the same way that we would expect it for a classical oscillator to be. So there are aspects of the classical dynamics that say something about the stationary states. But stationary states don't capture classical evolution. In fact, we kind of know that from the number phase uncertainty principle. N has a definite, I mean, an eigenstate of the number operator has a definite N. So it has a completely uncertain phase. In some sense, a stationary state is a state that's in some sense equally distributed around the whole circle with the completely uncertain phase. It has a definite energy, which means it's on this circle, but we don't know where it phases. Its phase is completely uncertain. So now we come to really the subject of today's lecture, which is So we seek 
a quantum state psi such that the expectation value, say, of x and p written either in the Schrodinger picture or the Heidegger picture, I don't care, follow the classical trajectory. Okay. We might also want not only that the mean value, but what we would like, if this is really as close as possible to classical, we would also kind of like it to be the case that the fluctuations in x and p at all times are minimum. Okay. That's to say, we want something that's as close as possible as a point in phase space that goes around like this with the minimum possible uncertainty. That we would call a quasi-classical state, a state such that the wave packet, in the center of the wave packet, moves around in phase space along the classical trajectory, and the uncertainty is minimal. That we would call a quasi-classical state. Does such a state exist? How would we find it? Well. We can guess. Okay? Let's unquantize. What do I mean by that? Well, we quantize by saying the classical amplitude alpha, which we had this particular form went to a quantum operator. Okay. Now, we seek a state that in some sense its x value is the classical x and its p value is the classical p. We seek a simultaneous eigenfunction of x and p. Now we can't do that because that violates the uncertainty principle, right? We can't find a state that is, has both a definite position and a definite momentum. But we want to find a state that is cl as close as possible to a state that has a definite x and a definite p. Well. Let's look for a state which is an eigenstate of A. This, if it was an eigenstate of A, it would have an X and a P. So let's look for a state that is an eigenstate of A with eigenvalue alpha. That, in some sense, would have both an x and a p, right? This is written, this is a x plus i p hat on this state. Is this Now, there's no guarantee that such a state exists. Why don't I know? Why, why can't I just say, of course, every operator has eigenvectors, doesn't it? It's not remission. In fact, it's not only not remission, it's not normal. A and A dagger don't commute. Their commutator is one. And we, only, and we know that the only operators that are guaranteed to have a complete set of eigenvectors are normal operators, and those are the permission operators and the unitary operators. But this is neither uh, 
permission nor unitary. So we don't know that such a thing exists. In fact, there are no, I, I, I will, we will show that they do in a moment. But we might have asked for this. And in fact, there are no I vectors of a dagger. They don't exist. There are, in the mathematics, there are eigenvectors of A, but not of A dagger. Okay, so I'm going to look for those states in a moment. But what if such a state existed? If a set of states existed, what would, they, what would their properties be? We'll prove in a moment what those states are. But what would, why are, why are these states the quasi-classes? Well, let's see if they have the properties that I asked of them. Okay. Let's, what is the expected value of the position in this state? Well, we, by definition, I said alpha, the quasi-classical state, is an eigenvector of the annihilation operator with eigenvalue alpha. So, how am I going to evaluate that? Anybody have a suggestion? You can't put it in the form of the creation of annihilation. Sure we can. But, but there's no, for the annihilation. Aha, but that, your good point, see, but let's do it. on this, it gives me alpha. But this acting on that, where I don't know. However, yes, Paul, oh, excellent. I can act it to the left. Because this is true. Excellent. So this is alpha plus alpha star over root two, which is exactly what we have classically. This is root 2 times the real part of alpha, which is x. The x, if we wrote alpha as 1 over root 2, x plus i mean. Right? And similarly, Is the imaginary part, which is B. It's what we expect. And if I had wanted to look at this as a function of time, I could do it in the Heisenberg picture. Right? That's the expected value of position as a function of time. That's how you do it. And we just solve that. This is equal to the expected value of x zero cos omega t plus p zero sine omega t. Right? This is the classical The mean value of position of momentum as a function of time follow the classical trajectory. Exactly. The mean value of this wave packet follows the classical trajectory. Now, in 
some sense, that's always true because the Heisenberg equations of motion, it's just that these guys have the, their fine, and, as opposed to the stationary state where these were zero, the mean value at zero was zero, and therefore the mean value at zero was always zero. These guys can have any uh, value we like. What about their uncertainty? So let's look at the uncertainty in X, the variance write this in terms of A and A matter, right? But we have to ensure that all the A's are on the right and all the A daggers are on the left. Because we know how A dagger acts on this, and we know how A acts on that, but we don't know it the other way around. So let's do it. Of uncertainty in X and T. 
And as a function of time, what happens? This thing moves around. Just like the classical trajectory, it's got a little, what is technically known as the uncertainty bubble. And it just moves around at angular velocity only. These are quasi-classical states. By the way, they're also they, these states were um, examined and brought to the fore most in detail in quantum optics by Roy Glauber in the 1960s. And in the context of quantum optics, and now they're almost always simply called the coherent states. The term coherent is kind of technical. It has to do with optical coherence. It's not important why they're called coherent states, but they are also typically called the coherent states. But they're, but they're the quasi-classical states for the harmonic oscillator. Yes, sir. So is the only superposition of number states that's unaffected by the lowering operator, does that be like an infinite, like how component of the uh, number states? Um, so we're going to look at that in a moment. It, it has a five, it has a, uh, it is a normalizable state. It is a well-defined state. It has, it has probability amplitude over all number states, but it falls off very rapidly. Okay. So it's localized in number. Okay, we'll talk about that in a moment. The state that is a complete equal superposition of all number states is the phase state. So the phase state you could think about as this state, a state which is localized at a given phase, but has a completely indefinite number. It goes off to infinity. It's localized and has a perfectly well-defined phase, but a completely uncertain number, completely uncertain energy. It has a definite time, but a completely uncertain energy. This is the time-energy uncertainty relation. But that help us does this long nicer than that. Yeah. Okay. Now, do you think states exist? There's no guarantee they do. But they do, and let me show you how. We already know of one such state, a state which is an eigenstate of the annihilation operator. Can you tell me a state that's an eigenstate of the annihilation operator? Besides that. <laughs> but those are, those are general states. But there's one you've seen already. The ground state. The ground state, excellent. My value goes to, to, it goes to zero. Its eigenvalue is zero. Ah. Exactly. So A acting on this is zero times that, right? That's zero. So this is an eigenvalue. This state is, an, is a coherent state. The ground state is a quasi-classical state. It's a state whose mean value is zero. So in this case, alpha equals zero. That is to say, x equals p is zero. That's the ground state. That's the state that would be classically, it would be the origin of phase space. That would be the state that would do nothing. Quantumly, it's a state which is an uncertainty bubble around the origin. So this is the quasi-classical version of the state that just has no position, no momentum. It's at the bottom of the well. Classically, it would just be at the bottom of the well. Quantumly, it has, it's kind of fluctuating. Now, of course, that's a little bit of a confusion picture because it's really a stationary state. But let me just um, ask you the following question. Suppose I have x and t. And suppose that I have a probability distribution of initial complex amplitudes, initial x and p, that is adimuthally symmetric. What would happen? Well, the whole thing would go around at omega t. And it would be stationary. I couldn't tell the difference. So if I had a classical distribution, that's to say, 
I'm not going to tell you what X and P are. I'm going to prepare with my little ball peen hammer and pull it. But I'm not going to tell you what it is. And I'm going to tell you that I'm going to uniformly distribute it around the origin. Well then, at any time, it would, your, what you would see would be completely stationary. It wouldn't tell the difference. It would all go around. So this is equivalent, absolutely equivalent, to a classical distribution of possible X and P's that are as a mutually symmetric around the origin. That's a stationary state, classically. Okay, so that's one. We're done. We got no, that, no, no. We just got one uh, of these five classical states. How can I make another? Here's the trick. All right. So we call that D, and with the dimensions in there, that was equal to either the i over h bar x. Uh, p hat minus p x hat. No, that's not the squeezing operator. Okay. The squeezing operator had a dagger squares and a dagger squares. This was the displacement operator. Remember, we have that e to the minus i p, or, uh, ooh, I guess I have this backwards. p x hat minus Remember that we had that e to the i x p hat is a translation in position. That is to say, momentum generates translation in position. And e to the plus i p x hat is a translation in momentum. That is to say, the position operator translates the momentum. This operator has both. Okay? Uh, and this operator had the following, well, I could write this also in dimensionless units. Characteristic momentum, characteristic position x hat, now I have capital P capital X minus capital X we have. And what is the product of the characteristic position times the characteristic momentum? H bar. X times P is H bar. This is why not putting the twos makes this pretty. Otherwise, we'd have a two there. All right. And this had the property we showed in homework that this had the property that if you did the unitary transformation on x, it translated in x. And if you did the unitary transformation on P, it translated in P. Or dimensionlessly, it does the same thing. OK? So now I ask you. Let's write it in terms of dimensionless. What is this? Hint. This is equal to x plus ip. A plus alpha. A plus alpha. Right? Because x gets translated by the real number x, and p gets translated by the number. So you have x plus ip, that's alpha. So this is equal to a plus alpha. 
It translates in phase space. This is a phase space translation. It takes something and translates it by the complex amplitude alpha. So in fact, we can express the displacement operator in terms of the complex amplitude instead of the real and the parts. state of the annihilation operator with eigenvalue alpha? If it was, that would be great, because that would just be my state localized at that point with that minimum uncertainty. So let's do it. Let's con consider the phase-based displacement operator on the ground state. Okay. I consider, I'll consider What is, if I apply, I, I claim that this is equal to alpha. That's to say, this is an eigenstate of the annihilation operator with eigenvalue alpha. How do we prove that? Any suggestions? Yeah, it's a good one. Apply the annihilation operator. Let's just do it. So let's take this and apply it to the displaced ground state. Now what? What do we know about the displacement operator and and uh, what do we know about it? We know this. So what are we going to do? Put the e dagger on. We, we can't just apply d dagger because that's not the identity. I mean, if we had an equation, you know, both sides. Oh, okay. So we can't just willy-nilly apply the operator we like. But what do we know? It's unitary. D dagger d. Exactly. We know it's unitary. So I can apply d, d dagger. That's cool. I can do that. That's the identity. And now what is this? That's that. It displaces it by alpha. This then is equal to 
D on alpha, A plus alpha on that, right? This is a constant. It comes out. And what about this? Zero. Zero. Voila! The displaced ground states are quasi-classical states. So they all, yes. all start rotating around the origin? Exactly. So if at time equals zero, I give my I take my particle on the spring and I pull it and I give it a push or a pole or whatever, or I take my hammer, then I give it an X and a P and let it go. And it will Right? What it means, of course, is that the wave packet goes up, comes back down. Okay? The wave packet, which was the Gaussian uh, um, at the origin is now a Gaussian here and it comes to the turning point and then it turns around. And it's classically oscillating. Okay. Now we can see that kind of wave packet picture. We we showed this sort of in the Heisenberg picture. Let's look at it in the Schrodinger picture. That is to say, let's look at the time evolution of the wave function given an initial condition that at time t equals zero, the state is this. Okay. Does it rotate around? on the ground state. That's cool. Now what? Well, this is the exponentiation of something. Stephen is fine solution, but it's easier to put this in here. Let me just call this U. Okay. 
and I'm going to stick in a U U dagger. Okay. Now U dagger acting on the vacuum is what? Should be U dagger U. It should be. Yep. That would be better. Okay. Thank you. So what's U acting on the vacuum? Yeah, it doesn't do anything to it. It's a stationary state. So this is equal to U of T B to alpha U dagger at the of that. Now here's the trick. We have D over there. So I'm going to write it out. E to the alpha A dagger minus alpha star A. Now what? Put it in the exponent, right? U e to the a u dagger is equal to e to the u a u dagger. So this is equal to e to the alpha u a Dagger, dagger minus alpha star u all that. Now what? It does. So we got to be a little bit careful here, but you're right, absolutely right. What do we know? What do we know from time evolution? So we know from the time evolution So that's true, right? But we got the U and the U dagger on the wrong spot. Just switch the sign. Switch the sign because you know that U dagger of T is equal to U of minus T. So this is E to the plus. I omega t a, and this is e to the minus i a dagger. And so, what we see here is that this is equal to e to the alpha minus i omega t a dagger minus star A acting on the ground state. And what's that? Oscillates between the two? The it's, it, it, what is this operator? It's just like the squeeze operator. Well, it's not the squeeze operator. Oh, it's not the squeeze. It's this operator. It's the displacement operator. It's D of T. But it's D with at a function at alpha T. Which is just alpha T. In other words, the time evolution just makes it still an eigenstate of the annihilation operator. But with the new eigenvalue corresponding to the time evolved classical phaser. That is to say, this thing is just the classical phase. So it's, as I was saying, 
this coherent state just is a new coherent state which whose mean value follows the classical trajectory. It's beautiful. I love it. Okay, so now let's come to the question of number and phase uncertainty. That a coherent state cannot be an eigenstate of the number operator because it has a well-defined phase. A state with a well-defined phase must cannot have a well-defined number. What about the number? So is this an eigenstate? If I look at the number operator on this, it's not an eigenstate, right? Because that's a dagger a acting on that. Which is alpha a dagger on that, which is something. It's not an eigenstate. So alpha is not an eigenstate of the number operator. What is the mean value? Alpha squared. 
and the uncertainty in it is equal to the square root. Because the square is equal to the mean. So, given this fact, do you know of a probability distribution whose fluctuations, this is correct, whose fluctuations are equal to the square root of the mean? Poisson. Poisson. This is corresponding to a Poisson distribution. So, how do we see that, that this is Poisson? We want to find the probability distribution in the number. I want to know the probability distribution of having a certain number of excitations of my oscillator. How do I find that? Well, what is it by definition? I, oh, this, this is, I, have, I wonder what is the probability to find the particle at the level n, given that it's in a coherent state? I just look at the one. Right? So I want to know what is the expansion of the coherent state in the number basis? What's the probability of having that? So let's look at those. Well, that's going to be complicated because out, the way we define alpha, alpha is the displacement operator acting on the vacuum, right? That's how we know the ground state. Excuse me if I call it the vacuum. Uh, so this is e to the alpha a factor minus alpha star a. Now here's a trick. Remember we have this is equal to separate these guys when A and D commute with their common, right? And that is the case here. So the displacement operator using this rule is e to the minus a half alpha squared to the alpha a dagger, e to the minus alpha star a. So with that said, the coherent state is equal to e to the minus alpha squared e to the alpha a factor, e to the minus alpha star a, acting on the back. Now what? Well, a acting on this gives me 0. So every term in this will be e to the 0, so that's 1. This I can use it right as a Taylor series. you get the nth eigenvalue 
I can say this n over the square root of n factorial on that is that. So this is equal to the sum n equals 0 to infinity alpha to the n over the square root of n factorial e to the minus alpha squared n. And this is this. So, what is the probability distribution? It's the square of that. The probability of seeing n excitations is the square of that amplitude, which equals alpha squared to the power n e to the minus alpha squared over n factorial. But alpha squared is the mean n. This is equal to e to the minus the average n, average n to the power n over n factorial. Do you recognize that probability distribution? That's a Poisson distribution. So for a coherent state, we don't have a definite number. We have number fluctuations. The number fluctuations go like the square root of the mean. That's Poissonian. Those fluctuations relative to the mean become smaller and smaller as the mean gets bigger and bigger. It becomes more and more classical. But nonetheless, they're always there. There's always that. What about the phase? Let's just conclude with the phase. Now that's complicated because we have to calculate this thing. Right? So if I plug that in over here, you know, that's equal to the sum uh, n equals 0 to infinity. Then I have this distribution over here. I have e to the minus alpha squared over 2 over 2. Uh, square root of n factorial alpha e to the minus i phi to the power of n. Square. Let's plug in that in. Now, what we can say, though, is that this sum is going to have these very rapid oscillations, except where the phase of this cancels the phase of that. That is to say, if I wrote alpha as some, at some phase as zero, then this is going to have a very, this sum is going to be very big. Away, when the phase is away from this phase, this is going to have lots of oscillations, and those terms will tend to cancel. So we kind of expect this probability distribution to be peaked around the phase of alpha. In fact, it is. And if I were to draw this picture here, say here's my coherent state. It has a mean n. It has this uncertainty bubble, has a width square root of 2. Then I ask you, what is the width in phase? Now it's going to depend, the width and phase is going to depend on n, right? The bigger it is, it's way out there. In the same, this is going to be a much smaller. So what is the answer just geometrically? Yeah, it's just 1 over uh, root 2 square root of n. I mean, not even that, right? Just looking at that, 
picture, some geometry. So that tells me that for a coherent state, the fluctuations in phase, my uncertainty in phase, are equal to a half the mean value squared. But that's equal to a half times the uncertainty in A. So this is a minimum uncertainty wave packet, let's say mean value squared. That's to say delta n, I don't know, it's factors of two here, maybe it's twice, I should call it phase twice that. <laughs> but the point here is that this is, you know, of order. It's a minimum uncertainty packet. So the quasi-classical states are important states in thinking about the fact that in the harmonic oscillator, we can create wave packets that go just like the classical trajectories. And they are a way, they are important, particularly in thinking about quantum fields. Because if I wanted to think about the state of a, of a field, which is an oscillator, the field states, which are classical-like, classical fields, are coherent states. The state of the quantum electromagnetic field that comes out of a radio antenna or out of a laser beam is described by a coherent state. All right. So now that concludes our discussion of the simple quantum oscillator. And uh, we'll have some problems on that. Thank you.